Hey guys, welcome back to Full Stop Reviews, your one-stop shop for all things movie. And today, as I have been for the past month, we will be talking about another movie in the Criterion Collection. Yet again, we're talking about a movie set during the Second World War. Um, but unlike the other two movies, I'm going to do a content warning for this video. This movie is has a reputation as being one of the most disturbing movies ever made, and there's a couple of reasons for that, and... To really get in depth to this review and kind of a mini analysis of this movie, I'm going to have to cover some of these topics. So if topics like sexual assault and violence concern you or anything even remotely related to genocide, please click away now. I am not fucking around and neither is this movie. Okay, with that out of the way... Um, as I said before, we're going to be covering the Criterion Collection. Like I said, when I started doing this at the beginning of the month, I wanted to cover a different movie from a different country every single time I did this. And so this movie is actually from the Soviet Union, and it's in Russian, so that fulfills my two criteria. Uh, different language, different country. But it's set during the same time period as the others. But unlike the others, uh, you're going to walk out of this one needing therapy. I am talking about Ilim Klimov's 1985 seminal work, Come and See. So Come and See, a basic plot summary is it's about Flora, a young Belarusian boy who dreams of adventure and he leaves his hometown village to join a group of Soviet partisans expecting a romantic, heroic adventure and he finds misery instead. I really can't get too deep into this review without talking about some of the real events that this movie concerns. So this is your second warning. I'm going to be talking and showing some very, very disturbing things. So if that bothers you, please click away now. Also, I'm going to be spoiling the movie a little bit. I'm going to try and avoid spoiling, but because this movie is based off of real events, I'm going to be talking about those, and I might inadvertently end up spoiling the film anyways. To really understand the full impact of this movie, I'm going to be talking about some of the backgrounds behind it. So the movie is about Soviet partisans, essentially, fighting in World War II. What happened was, in June 1941, Operation Barbarossa, which was the German invasion of the Soviet Union, commenced. And they swept through as many of the Soviet states as possible, Belarus, Lithuania, Estonia, etc., and eventually went into Russia. And the advance went all the way up until the gates of Moscow, basically, where it stalled for the winter. But because the Germans were using their blitzkrieg tactics and they, the whole idea was to do this, do the invasion as quickly as possible, they weren't very thorough with clearing out some of the lines. While they were initially successful with their offensives, what ended up happening is lots of Soviet fighters got trapped behind enemy lines, and because the Germans kept moving, they were just kind of stuck there. And so what they did is that they, they formed partisan groups and then commenced, for the next few years of the war, a system of asymmetrical warfare until the Red Army was able to push back west. There were other independent partisan and resistance movements popping up around this time, so the Home Army for Poland, for example, and other independent partisan groups, so like the Jewish partisan group uh, formed by the Bielski brothers, also covered in the movie Defiance, which I will be referencing later in this movie. Part of the German motivation for this invasion was their idea that the Aryan people needed what they called living space, essentially. And what that meant was that they wanted to clear out the Slavic peoples and then repopulate that same land with Aryan people. Like with Jews and other minorities or other ethnic groups, Slavic peoples were seen as subhuman races by the Germans, and so they were, like like the others, they were earmarked for deportation and eventually extermination. So what the Germans did on their way east is, like other places, they essentially just went scorched earth, especially as the war started to go south. So in Belarusia, for example, one out of four people were killed, and 13 million Soviet citizens total were estimated to have been murdered by the Germans. And this is something that doesn't really get covered by Western media a whole lot because the Western media focuses on essentially the Western fronts of the war, but the Eastern Front is known as 
the site of the three or four bloodiest battles in world history. Uh, Kursk, Leningrad, the sea in the Siege of Stalingrad. And as per Atonche Films, at least one million babies were born as the product of rape from what the Wehrmacht and the SS were getting up to. And so the entire thing was just an assembly line of atrocity after atrocity after atrocity. And on March 22nd, 1943, the inspiration for this film occurred. In the Belarusian village of Katyn, not to be confused with the Katyn massacre in terms of Katyn, Poland, where the Soviet army executed about 22,000 military officers in the Polish army. Katyn was a Belarusian village where the Germans rolled in, rounded up almost 200 villagers, locked them in a shed, and then burned it to the ground. Almost 200 people were burned alive. This event occurred over 600 times in different villages. As per the ending cards of this film, 628 Belarusian villages were burned to the ground along with their inhabitants. And there might have been more. The estimate up until about 1980 was about 200 villages until they started unearthing evidence that, no, it was actually way more than people had initially thought. So going back, going back to that initial stat, one out of every four citizens of Belarusia died. The further inspiration from this movie came from lived experiences from some of the cast and crew of this movie as well. Ilum Klimov was a teenager at the time of World War II's outbreak and had to evacuate the city of Stalingrad as the fighting got really bad. He recalled seeing the Volga River on fire as he was leaving the city. Alice Adamovich, the man who wrote the screenplay with Klimov, was a partisan. He was in Belarusia at the time and eventually fought with the partisans in probably one of the most brutal theaters of war humankind has ever seen. And so this is all lived experience that you are seeing on screen. There is very, very little about this movie that isn't authentic to somebody's lived experience. And so that's one of the most horrifying things about this movie in general is that it's there's not a lot that's made up. There's not a lot that is exaggerated. Rumor has it there was, in one of the initial screenings of this film, one of the audience members was an older man who, an older German man, who was a Wehrmacht officer, and he stood up in the crowd and said, everything you see on here actually happened. Like with The Great Escape, I really appreciate people drawing on lived experiences because it just gives it a deeper level of authenticity and a deeper layer to the urgency of the message that this film is trying to convey. One of the interesting cultural aspects about this movie was that part of the inspiration for this movie was the fact that it was they were coming on the 40th anniversary of the end of the war. And so that was part of the motivation for trying to get this movie made. Having said that, it took almost eight years for the Soviet government to allow Klimov to make this movie. He didn't have a very good relationship with the Soviet government as they kept trying to censor previous movies of his and this one was no different. They kept saying no again and again and again. Their reasoning was that this movie was too realistic. And so there's a little bit of a traumatic memory and state controlled media at play here. Eventually they relented and the movie was released in 1985, 40 years after the war ended. I want to talk about Alice Adamovich a little bit more because he decided to interview survivors of some of the villages that were attacked and razed to the ground. And he eventually wrote a book called I Am From The Fire Village or Out Of The Fire, depending on the translation you're reading, that was essentially an oral history of all of these stories. In his own words, he couldn't fictionalize it. You couldn't make this stuff up. It, if you're going to tell the story, it had to come from the people who lived it. And so what I'm trying to illustrate is that there is an extreme attention to detail and there's an extreme devotion to the truth that this movie has that elevates it above most historical pieces and above most war films in general. In pursuit of authenticity, one of the stranger choices that Klimov made was to find a lead actor who hadn't acted before. And that is where Alexei Kravchenko comes into play. This was his first feature film role, and while he's a renowned actor now in Russia, it would be almost 15 years before he would start getting cast in roles again after this. He had no acting experience whatsoever, and most of the people in this movie were, even for Eastern Europe, relative unknowns. And most of the people, and many of the actors, so for example, Olga Mer Maranova, who plays Glasha, she never did anything again after this. 
it's a very, very difficult thing as a director to A, deal with child actors whom are the primary lead cast members of this film, and B, deal, deal with and direct people who aren't actors, and you would never know. It's a bold choice because when it pays off, it gives the whole thing an authenticity that doesn't feel rehearsed. And that is what they achieve here. And so it's a very, very bold and very, very difficult choice that paid off in a huge way here. So this movie has a reputation as one of the most disturbing films ever put to screen and one of the most effective anti-war films ever. And I really think that a huge reason for why this film succeeds the way it does is because this film is not presented as a war film. Sure, it has the same, it has some genre conventions, it has Nazis, it has Germans, it has Russians and heroic partisans, and there's kind of a standard hero's journey with certain war films where you have a naive individual setting out for war and seeing it as a great big adventure and eventually getting disillusioned with it along the way. I mean, in even in American literature tradition, we have that going back to Stephen Crane's famous novel, The Red Badge of Courage. The genre trappings are there, but it's not presented in an action-adventure way. It's presented as if it were a horror movie. And I find the way that they produce this infinitely fascinating. There's a couple of different ways that they accomplish this effect through the use of cinematography, their use of sound, and just the way that they frame these events, period. This film has more in common with, say, The Shining than it does Full Metal Jacket or Apocalypse Now or say, even Saving Private Ryan. The cinematography is almost Kubrickian in a sense that they make a lot of use of single-point framing, where it's kind of like how I'm... I'll, ta I'll take out the uh, borders for a second to show you what I mean. I'm dead center in the frame. I'm staring right at the camera right now. And if you look too long, it's going to be kind of uncomfortable because there's kind of a connection between you seeing this video and you looking directly into my eyes. And I haven't even blinked in a couple of seconds. Okay, I got to blink now. So there's a lot of one single point framing. There's a lot of extreme close-ups done with this. And so even in lighthearted moments, you are still staring directly into the souls of the characters. But it also feels the entire time like they're staring just straight back into you. And there's something incredibly disturbing about that, especially as the film goes on and our characters become more and more traumatized by the events around them. And it feels like they're just, so many of the characters just feel like they're just dead behind the eyes. And so there's something very, very deeply unsettling as they stare straight into the camera and straight into the viewer. And there's a couple of scenes where you, when you finally meet the Germans in this film, one of them proselytizes about Nazi ideology and he just has this dead expressionless look. It's the whole banality of evil idea kind of played out in the worst possible way. But it creates this sort of intimacy with the viewer that you wouldn't otherwise have because of the rest of the framing is so horrific in the way that the characters act is sometimes very, very unnatural for the circumstances. And there's a certain irrationality to the way that the characters act sometimes just because they're so traumatized and out of their minds that you can never quite grasp what anybody's thinking or you can never quite connect you're, you're you're kind of like so close but so far and so there's kind of a coldness to the presentation even in some of the more lighthearted scenes in this movie there's just a distance between you and the characters but there's an uncomfortable closeness at the same time and so sometimes it's played to comedic effect and sometimes when the film goes on and the events get more and more horrifying to watch you're gripped and kind of involved as a witness to these events in such a way you otherwise would not have. You as a viewer just kind of feel trapped by what you're seeing because of your proximity to these characters. Another way that the cinematography is really put to good use here is the fact that it's almost all natural lighting. And so it's kind of like Barry Lyndon in a sense where it's Barry Lyndon, for those of you who might not know, also in the Criterion Collection, went to great lengths to frame it as natural lighting in such a way that it would feel like you're actually there. If you were living these events, this is how you would see it. And so there's something like that to this movie as well. Because it's all natural lighting, the lights never get very bright, the darks are always super dark, and the color scheme of this film is just muted the entire time. The color scheme seems to alternate between a greenish-brownish earth tone type color 
and this creepy dead icy grayish bluish color which is used a lot in horror movies so like saw uses it at points but the ring is another good example of this um hell even the shining uses it at some points and there's a very very desaturated look to everything because of because of the natural lighting and then the kind of grainy film stock it feels like you're watching a documentary over a decade later saving private ryan would go for some of the similar effects similar with the colors at least obviously they didn't use natural lighting at least not the whole time but the whole idea is to give it this grainy realistic feel like if you're watching a documentary and there just happens to be a camera in front of some of these events and that's kind of it creates that kind of immediate connection that you you're just trapped with these characters in these events that you can't get away and if you've watched this channel you know that i'm a huge fan of like landscape shots because i'm a i'm a huge nature person i love going hiking etc and there's 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 a lot of like wide landscape shots in this film as well but because of the color scheme, it just kind of just feels flat and like there's always something lurking out there. And there are other scenes where it's a, it's a wide, but it, the entire thing's covered in fog. And so you can't see a damn thing. Or you're seeing large swaths of nature just blown up or shot to hell with bullets. You really feel how destructive the war can be, even from like seeing a bullet hit a tree and just having the tree just explode. Part of the way that got this effect is that they used live ammunition. And shit, that wouldn't happen today. So there's also a scene where a cow gets shot. Yeah, they, they uh, killed a cow for this movie. There's another effect that they do with the cinematography in this movie that is closer to a horror film than it is to a war film. So I'm going to contrast with Saving Private Ryan again. In the Normandy landings, you get lots of close-ups. Uh, you, the intention of the initial scenes of the Normandy landing is to make you feel like you're on those boats. So you're sick, there's shaky cam, and then bombs start flying, and it's disorienting, and you can't hear or see anything, and again, you're shaking. And so the whole idea is to make you feel a subjective experience. And, but it also gives you grand sweeping shots of the battle so you can see what's going on. You don't typically, you don't really get that here. Instead, you get lots of steady cam shots there's not like there are handheld shots but it's more steady and a lot of times the camera just follows these characters around sometimes a lot of times in the one point perspective that i mentioned earlier and so it feels like the camera's always pursuing these characters it, the camera almost feels like a tendril of an entity that's watching these characters you never quite feel safe when the camera moves around like that because it, it just gives the sense that something is always watching you and these characters it kind of reminds you of the Evil Dead a little bit, where with the spirits running in the woods. Here, I'll show you what I mean. And here's another example of what I mean. This time I'm going to use footage from The Shining. So in both... The Shining and The Evil Dead, the camera work is used to imply that there's something out there, something lurking, something that you, the viewer, can never see. You have no idea what the fuck these things look like. And in The Shining, it just feels like this creepy giant entity that you can't quite understand in almost a Lovecraftian kind of way that is still pursuing and always watching. And so that's kind of the same, the same effect is achieved here is that there's something always out there, there's something always lurking, there's something always watching. So I want to talk about how the Germans are framed for a minute, because the Germans, if you've seen Dunkirk, Christopher Nolan went for kind of a similar idea here, where you don't really ever see the Germans until the end of the film. But before that point, there is such a build up to when you're seeing them. Because one of the uh, misleading things about seeing this film for the first time is that there's not as much violence in it 
as you would expect. There's a lot of aftermath. There's a lot of implied violence, but there's a lot of reaction shots. And that's really what gets you is that there's a lot of cutaways. And so you don't even really see the Germans for a long time in this film. You see machine guns firing, you hear planes flying overhead, you see villages and piles of bodies everywhere. You have characters who think they're safe in the middle of the forest when bombs start falling. But a lot of times the Germans are just this kind of off-camera force to be reckoned with. And then the film doesn't even give subtitles for when they're speaking in German. It only gives subtitles for when they're speaking in Russian or Belarusian. There's kind of like a dehumanization in a certain sense, just to reflect the inhumanity of what was going on at the time. A lot of times it feels like the characters are battling or running away from this force of nature. Like it's not even human beings that they're fighting. It's this, it's a storm that they can't escape. By doing it that way, the entire situation and all of the characters feel like they are stuck in something so much bigger than them and that they have such little agency and control over that there's no way to even comprehend something that big. And again, there's a kind of Lovecraftian quality to that kind of micro but macrocosmic horror at the same time that it, it really recalls to mind in The Shining. In The Shining, there are no definitive answers, at least in the Kubrickian version. Another way that this film presents itself like a horror film instead of a traditional war film is its use of sound. Like other war films, Saving Private Ryan being chief amongst them, it does go for subjective experiences with both camera shots. You get point of view shots. You also get point of view sound effects. So for example, there's a bombing probably about 30, 40 minutes into the film, and then one of the characters loses their hearing for a little bit. And so for a while, you're just, you're seeing bullets flying everywhere, but you can't hear them. You can kind of hear them. Other characters are screaming out to this character, but he can't really hear them all that well, and neither can you. You can just kind of hear muffled voices shouting. And so it, the, this, it puts you in the subjective experiences of these characters often, early and often. Like I said earlier, when shit really starts getting going bad, it feels like it's happening to you. Another thing that the soundtrack does is that there really isn't much of a soundtrack, at least a non-diegetic one. While there are musical pieces that get used, like Mozart at the end of the film, for example, most of the, most of the music that happens here is diegetic or implied to have been imagined in the heads of the character. So, for example, there's a sweet little dancing scene between Glasha and Flora, our, our female and male protagonist, and it's kind of a sweet scene, and the two of them are bonding, but there's also something just kind of off about it. You can't tell if they can both hear it, if one of them's hallucinating, or if they're both hallucinating, and there's kind of, it gives the whole sequence this kind of fever dreamy type feel, despite the fact that the entire film is just a waking nightmare. But instead of uh, traditional score or musical choices, a lot of the soundtrack is ambient for the most part. In a way that, again, recalls something like The Shining. And while The Shining uses Christoph Penderecki's works, and therefore its soundtrack is way more in your face... <laughs> Similar ideas are used here, where it's just this kind of unsettling rumbling throughout the entire film. And sometimes there's little stingers, but they're never over the top. And it's always fucking horrifying when the stingers do happen. And so the music never quite lets you get comfortable with anything you're seeing in this film. And obviously it was intentional, but the music is just unsettling. Because, like... Again, going back to Saving Private Ryan, the John Williams score is fantastic, but it's this brass army section that's kind of mournful, but kind of patriotic and almost heroic. And that film is trying to communicate a very, very different idea about World War II than this one is. So again, that movie has very, very different aims. But a lot, with a lot of war films, you get kind of like an army band or a brass section or, or mournful but somewhat respectful pieces. Here, it's just creepy. Like sometimes it's really cacophonous. Like sometimes there's diegetic music that gets played 
and the diegetic music is so discordant with what's happening on screen that it's just disturbing. The soundtrack never lets you get comfortable, the cinematography never lets you get comfortable, and just the weird creepy ways that the characters, even the sympathetic characters in this movie, kind of act around each other. And when they're staring directly at you, nothing about this movie lets you stay comfortable. It just gets under your skin and then crawls around the entire time. And one more brilliant piece of sound work that I want to highlight in this film is the plane. One of the constant signs of danger in this film is that there's a German spy plane that's constantly flying overhead. And every time it does, it's a foreshadowing to something really bad happening. You don't know what, and you don't know when the axe will drop. And sometimes it doesn't drop for a while. So for example, you see a plane really, really early on into the film, in the first scene, in fact, but the payoff to that plane, to what that plane is foreshadowing, doesn't happen for almost an hour into the film. But sometimes you see what it's foreshadowing in, a, in the very next scene. And so you're never quite comfortable whenever you see that plane either, because you don't know when the axe is going to drop. But the other creepy thing about the plane is you hear it before you see it, which is obviously what the experience of the characters would be, because as anybody that's lived near an airport can tell you, you hear these things long before you see them. The sound of the plane is like this low but loud rumble, and it kind of feels like it's part of the soundtrack at points, just because of how well mixed in there it is. Every time you hear it, your skin just starts to crawl because you know what that means. Because that plane's always a harbinger of death. So let's talk about that climactic scene. I won't say what happens, but if you've been paying attention to this video, and especially the history of what inspired this movie, you'll know, pro you'll probably have a good idea of what happens. I could even tell you surface value what happens and it still wouldn't match your experience of seeing it because the music cuts out the subjective shots for the most part cut out for this it feels like you're witnessing an atrocity as if you were actually there like this is what it would sound like if you were to witness the nazis just murdering people this is what you would hear this is what you would see and sometimes you can just smell the gasoline and the gunpowder and so the scene starts out with just this single motorcycle rider riding in this fog and using using one of those uh, Steadicam tracking shots that I was talking about. Given the biblical allusions of the title, you can't help but think of that fourth horseman, the pale rider. If you know anything about how the Nazis kind of tricked people into being okay, being rounded up into trains or something like that, you'll know exactly where this is going and when they start saying some of the familiar lines. Again, I'm not going to spoil it, but... And you just feel this pit in your stomach get larger and larger and larger as the scene progresses because there is no relief. There, You have to watch every single minute of it. And the most horrifying thing is is that in some of when the axe finally does drop with this scene, you don't quite see anything. Like I said, you see a lot of aftermath. So a character gets... A character earlier in the film gets covered in petroleum and then set on fire and lives, at least to a certain extent. You don't see it happening. You just see the aftermath. But that's enough because you've seen the Nazis, when you finally do meet them, they're acting so inhumanely and just so dead behind the eyes kind of look. And some of them are just so fucking gleeful with the carnage that they're creating that it creates this really discordant atmosphere with the horrified reactions of Flora, our young protagonist. He is kind of an author insert for Alice Adamovich because he was about the same age when he joined the Partisans. And so this character is based off of his experiences. And the physical transformation this guy goes through is terrifying to watch because he starts out as this normal enough young boy and he just looks like a fucking wretched old man at the end. Like the way, like look at this cover. This is grotesque. The psychological trauma that these characters are experiencing are reflected with their outward appearances. So Glasha gets covered in mud and is screaming and crying hysterically one of the last times you see her. And with Flora, it looks like he ages about 40 years in the span of a week and a half. And fun fact about this movie, Ilium Klimov was very, very concerned about Alexei Kravchenko's mental health when he was making this movie. So great lengths were actually taken to ensure that this kid would not be traumatized by the movie he was making. 
So props to him. He was put on a starvation diet, and like I said, they were using live ammo. Sometimes they only went a couple of inches over the characters, mainly him, his head. According to the legend about this film, this was so stressful that a combination of all of this and all the weight that he had to lose at the age of 14, which is an age you really should be doing that kind of thing, and the hair dye that they used to like distort his hair. He had gray hairs for a few years after this film. He's fine now, physically. But this, this, the role just took its toll. One of the reasons why this is such a good performance is that it's not a very verbal one. It's very, very about the eyes and the body language. As an actor, acting with subtext and acting physically but not doing all that much is a really one of the more difficult parts about acting to begin with so the fact that this kid had no experience going into this film is fucking outstanding it's it's almost unbelievable just because of how brilliant this performance is you were drawn into this kid's world and you just want to give him a hug by the end and it's just it gets worse and worse and worse and worse So the last thing I want to talk about is, before before I give my official verdict, and I think you know what it's going to be, is that this is a very different kind of war film, and it's a very different kind of anti-war film. There's a very interesting montage at the end of the film that I won't spoil that actually introduces some really unexpected thematic questions, like how far do you go to fight an inhumanity like what the Germans were doing? French New Wave director Francois Truffaut has famously said that it is impossible to make an anti-war film because every film, regardless of its intentions, ends up being pro-war. Part of the reason he said that was that because the violence and destruction caused by war is an inherently cinematic idea. It's something that's very dramatic. It's exciting to watch. When we're watching Saving Private Ryan, we're horrified by the Normandy landings but there's an adrenaline to these scenes. There's a very specific drive to these scenes. It's very dramatic, and we want to know what happens next. Again, the Saving Private Ryan, in all fairness, has very different aims as a film. Its aims as a film were to highlight the struggles of a certain generation of what they went through in World War II, but from a very, very Western point of view. And so Klimov actually kind of lamented about this film later in his life that Western audiences couldn't really connect with a film like Come and See because it didn't really mesh with the narrative that they had created for World War II about themselves. It was so disharmonious with with the their preset narratives. And a lot of war films, especially films that deal with the Second World War, it's always, in a lot of cases, even if it's anti-war, it's about a small-town American boy going into a struggle much larger than himself going across the seas, having an adventure and saving the world. Sometimes they die in the process, sometimes they don't. But that's kind of the narrative that America has in like a Western sense, is that the Western, they're the good guys in this war. And, well, and while the Western sides definitely weren't blameless with uh, their wartime conduct, I think it's safe to say that they very objectively were the good guys in this case. But that experience isn't matched by some of the Eastern perspectives, some of the countries that just kind of got flatlined and steamrolled and just had to fight for their survival. Polish resistance fighters kept fighting throughout the duration of the war. So the best pilot unit in the Battle of Britain that recorded the most kills was a Polish unit that had escaped after the invasion of their country. For their troubles, Britain kicked them out of the country at the end of the war. Funny thing is, the Soviets didn't want him either. But with war films, violence is so cinematic and so dramatic that there's not many ways to show it as anything but that. And so you have a couple different types of war films. Sometimes they just focus on the tactics involved and then kind of take the human element out of it. Sometimes you'll follow characters. So like, we'll call this the Gettysburg approach. A Bridge Too Far does it this way. The Longest Day does it this way. To an extent, Black Hawk Down does it this way, where it's just focused on the events. And so you're following a huge swath of characters. So you're getting a very macro-level look at the battle. But like Black Hawk Down, those scenes are exciting. They're cool. When those, when those characters are rolling in with those helicopters, you feel pumped up. You feel badass. Well, it goes to hell later on in the movie. But there's always an exciting quality to it. This movie has none of it. You, you don't want to look with this movie, but you can't look away. 
and it's not even that violent of a film. So using Truffaut's definition, this might be the only anti-war film ever made. TV Tropes even has a name for this phenomenon. It's called Do Not Do This Cool Thing. So the movie Jarhead actually highlights this, where it's they're showing the Ride of the Valkyries scene in Apocalypse Now, which is meant to be this like crazy, what the fuck are you guys doing kind of scene. But it's one of the most famous scenes in cinema, and it's exciting to watch every single time. And you're rooting for the Americans, more importantly, in that film, for the most part, especially the first time you see it. But one of the cutaways in that montage is school kids running away. But Jarheads has a scene where these characters are seeing this and then just cheering the entire time, despite the fact that that is completely against what Coppola wants you to feel in that moment. Especially if you look into the history of Wagner and how that music was used in uh, Nazi ideology. This film is haunting. It sticks with you for a long time after you stop watching it. Many people won't even want to see this movie a second time, which is totally fair. I'm going to quote where the movie got its title from. Book of Revelations, chapter 6, verses 7 and 8. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was Death, and Hell followed him. And this film lives up to its source material. For all of these reasons, I'm going to give it a green light. But this movie is a very heavily qualified green light. Not everybody should see this movie. This is a very difficult movie to watch. It is a very fucking disturbing movie. And not everybody should. Not everybody's going to be able to handle it. The last thought I have about this film is that more so than any of the other reasons I just described, the soundscapes, the cinematography, the acting, the writing, etc., the real reason why this is so fucking horrifying is that you're watching this knowing that all of this happened, and it happened pretty much the way you're seeing it on screen. Like, the last thing you see before the titles cut to black for the end credits is a title card saying 628 Belarusian villages were burned along with their inhabitants. Not a lot was made up about this movie. Hey guys, I know you tuned in for a review and got a video essay instead. Thank you for sticking with me to the end on this one, guys. Heavy stuff and a longer one than I normally make, so thanks for sticking with me on this one. If you like what I have to say about this film and other films like this, or just not like this at all, tune in for Full Stop Reviews. I'm going to be going back and covering some more contemporary films uh, with my next video. And if you want to see me talk about movies a little bit more in depth with my friends, check out our Return of the Movie podcast, which is available anywhere you get podcasts. So give us a like, comment, subscribe, and as always, it is Full Stop Reviews. <laughs>